location base station within the cell, sort of in what's supposed to be the center of it. And then we have users that can move around freely within the area that is covered. And every user is connecting to the base station from which it is getting the stronger signal. And that is then creating these different cell areas of the direct locations where users prefer one base station compared to the other one. And cellular technology was sort of invented the idea maybe in the 1950s. Then in the late 1970s, it started to be deployed the first analog networks. And now we have then seen the first generation being utilized in the 90s, the second in the uh, uh, zero zeros. Then we have have the uh, uh, sorry, second in the 90s, third in the 2000s, and we had the fourth one, and then now the uh, fifth generation is showing up. And the transition has been from building a technology used for having mobile phones where you can make phone calls to actually using it mainly to transfer data. That could be a phone call, but a video call, but it could also be a video or whatever you like. And maybe it was in the last decade or, or two decades ago between uh, 2010 and 2015 that this really started to take off the mobile data traffic. So here I'm showing you graphs of the mobile data traffic in exabyte per month. That is a huge number. Um, and it shows uh, curves for different parts of the world. This comes from the Ericsson Mobility Report, which is sort of gathering data of how much data traffic there is in this part of the world up until this year, and then predicting what will happen in the future. So there's one curve here, the red one for the area, India, Nepal, Bhutan, and one for North America. And you can see that uh, uh, maybe North America started a bit earlier, but then since the population in India region is much larger, it has now outgrown the uh, in data traffic. And uh, of course, one should to figure out how much data every person in the country is uh, transferring. We should divide with number of people. But I think the interesting thing here is rather the fact that it goes up. It increases very quickly. There is an annual growth of like 25 to 30 percent. And uh, that means that even if we build technology that works to fine today, we need to improve it in the future in order to cater for more data traffic. And this will happen in all regions of the world. Uh, in developing regions, it might increase faster because it's sort of the first data service. And then when in developed part of the world, this is typically what we are expecting to see, 25 to 30% growth over the next decades. And uh, that means that we need to build new technologies all the time to, to deal with this. And to give you a sense of how wireless network or cellular networks like this are being improved over time, uh, this formula here is rather useful, I think. So the capacity of the network is the number of bits that we can transfer per second over a certain area measured in square kilometer. And it is a product of three different factors. One is the cell density. That is the number of base stations or cells like this that we are putting up per square kilometer. The next factor is the uh, available frequency spectrum that the operator have a license for, you can utilize. And the third factor is something called a spectral efficiency, measured in bits that can be transferred per second and per hertz of spectrum and per cell. And this is uh, a lot about what kind of technology we put into the base station. Well, this is how much spectrum we can acquire license for, and this is how many base stations we put up. And over the past decades, a lot of the improvements have been in these two different first factors, cell density and available spectrum. And I will show you what that really have implied. So here I'm showing you a network. There are four base stations at the center of square cells, just to make the shape look simple. And uh, if you are close to your base station, you have a strong signal in your phone, and therefore, you can get a high data rate because the data rate is sort of uh, determined by the single strength. And if you are far away, you will have less signal strength, you get lower data rate, and you also get a lot of interference from the neighboring cells. So this is what I'm showing here. For different positions, what data rate do you get? And if you're close to one of the base stations, you get a high data rate. 
Uh, in this case, I have 10 megahertz of spectrum and the maximum thing I can get is 80 megabit per second if you are in the center of the cell. And then it drops down rather quickly and if you are at the edge of the cell, you have a much, much smaller data rate. If we are buying more spectrum, then what essentially happens is that you, you multiply all these numbers with that spectrum and you need to use and here I have assumed 10 times more bandwidth. Then you go from 80 to 800. And you need to spend 10 times more transmit power to achieve this as well. Uh, but the, the shape is the same, but you can get higher data rates if you can find more bandwidth. If you are putting up more base stations instead, this is the behavior that happens. You squeeze together the shape of these ones, but the shape stays the same. It's just that they are covering small regions. You still have the issue that if you are close to the base station, you get a strong signal. And if you are further away, it drops down. And while for bigger cells, it drops down only because of this, that the signal dies out quickly with distance. Uh, when you have a dense network, it's it also dominated by the fact that you, as you move away so that you are close to multiple base stations, you have a lot of interference. Uh, so the interference is limiting us instead. And it is somewhere in between these two different cases that we are today in the networks, namely that the shape is dictated not by the bandwidth or with the number of base station, but by this third factor that I was mentioning, the spectral efficiency. And the problem is that I, I think 4G of even uh, definitely 5G, but probably 4G as well, is providing you with a sufficiently high data rate if you stand next to the base station. Then all the things you would like to do, stream a Netflix video or have a video call, it will work flawlessly. The problem is that it doesn't work everywhere. So if you are walking around and try to watch a video or have a phone call uh, with video, then part of the time you will be down here and then it doesn't work. So I think that the most important thing to improve for future networks is to try to change the shape to something that is much more stable. And that is what uh, I will tell you about how to achieve. So I was mentioning that when you're transmitting a signal from a, a antenna, the signal is spreading out and uh, only a small portion of it will reach the receiver. And here is some more math on that. So if I have an antenna that is an ideal omnidirectional you know, or isotropic antenna that spreads out the energy in all directions equally much, then when you have a receiver which is at a distance r from the transmitter, then you should view it as your receiver is covering a small part of a big sphere of energy that is spreading out. And the fraction of the sent energy or power that is received at your mobile phone is proportional to the antenna, uh, to area of your receiver. So you take that area, you divide it with the total surface area of a sphere with radius r, and then this is what you receive. And already at a one meter distance, this would only be like 0.001% when you have a typical size of the, the receiver, uh, a few centimeters large. And if you are at 10 meters distance, it's 0.00001%. See, it becomes extremely small numbers. Uh, and if you, this is only when you're seeing the transmitter, if it's around the corner, so the signal is to bounce on different objects, there is even more losses. So typically in wireless, you are only receiving say one out of 1 billion parts of energy. So there is very large signal losses. So how can we improve that situation? Well, one thing would be to replace a small mobile phone with a bigger iPad. Everyone would walk around with a big phone. Uh, but we typically have the opposite thing that everyone, instead of having a bigger phone, they want to have a small uh, smart watch that it should be connected instead. So things are, they're squeezing down in size. The other option would be to not radiate the signal isotropical in all directions, but direct it towards the location of where the receiver is. And this is not a new idea. This is what we have been doing in wireless. Uh, for a long time and also in cellular communications. So this big base stations that I showed you on the first page um, that was put on the rooftop of Linship University building is what you see everywhere. It's a big uh, uh, antenna. It's a so-called high gain antenna that is focusing the energy 
down to earth where people are and not up in the sky where they're not supposed to be in the mobile phone customers. And uh, it could, for example, be a 16 dBi gain antenna. That means that you have 16 decibels stronger or 40 times stronger signal if you're standing underneath it uh, so that you are facing it perfectly. So if you are a lucky user, standing there, you have a 40 times stronger signal compared to if you uh, would have had just an antenna here that radiated equal in all directions. Uh, and this is how we typically do. We divide the world into different sectors uh, from the base station side. You focus the energy down on the ground where users are in 120 degree angle and you get 40 times stronger signal if you are in front of it. Uh, you're not creating an energy, you're directing energy, which means that if you're directing here, there will be less energy in other directions. So if you have these two guys here standing behind the building, you would like the signal to bounce off this building to reach them. The problem is that there is no signal amplification there. there. The signal amplification is just here, not in these directions. So what we would like to achieve is to let the space station not predefine, I will focus here, and if you're there, you're lucky. If you're not there, your problem. You, you would like the base station to actually be able to tune around where it is focusing the energy based on where you are for the moment. So how can we do this? Well, there is a principle called adaptive beam forming. So beam is what you're focusing and adaptive means you can move it around. So I will now tell you about how beam forming works and how it can be utilized in my communication and what it is as well. So I was mentioning you have an antenna that's transmitting. Suppose we have two antennas that are transmitting. Then they will send out radio waves like this. And I've now shown you to view the wave, radio wave as the sinusoid is moving. And when it's up at its maximum value, that is what I have shown here, the curves. And the green ones are containing the same signal at the same time. The gray is the same, orange are the same, and so on. And depending on where you are, you will either receive the signal from these two antennas at the same time or with different delays. In particular, if you are located in this direction here, upwards, then you see the green signals here are reaching you at the same time, the gray are reaching you at the same time, orange at the same time, and so on. So here you will create what is known as constructive interference, a stronger signal in that direction. So even if both the antennas are radiating the signal, in all directions equally much, what you will observe is not uh, this pattern that it's radiating in all directions, but it will look like for you that the signal is focused in your direction if you're here, while if you are in some other direction, there will be less energy. So in this way, you're creating over there the focusing. It's not done in the individual antennas, it's done over there because you have two antennas sending the same signal. And this is essentially how this big base station antennas uh, of the past is also built. They are, have, it contains many small elements sending the same signal focusing. So how do we do the adaptiveness? Well, consider now that you let the antenna to the right here transmit things with a small delay. So when it is transmitting the red signal, uh, then the left antenna have already transmitted two of these waves uh, earlier. Uh, and then you can see that the orange ones are overlapping here, the gray ones here, the green ones here, and so on. So there is an other direction where juices will happen to see the same signal at the same time. So what we are doing now is that we are over there creating a directive signal in another direction. So now you have two antennas, they are sending the same information signal, but with different delays in order to make sure that you get constructive interference in a particular direction. The signal from two antennas are reaching in that direction at the same time, amplifying each other to get a strong signal. So this is in a nutshell what adaptive beamforming is, uh, is meaning. And this is not a new idea. Uh, it's actually have a hundred years old uh, uh, idea. So, uh, for example, you can find a patent that was filed in 1917 and uh, approved in 1920, uh, where uh, a solution for this was proposed by Ernst Alexanderson. 
who got the IEEE Medal of Honor in 1919, uh, and he's typically said to be the father of radio and television. And so if people like Marconi or Brown and Tesla was sort of inventing um, or discovering many of the basic phenomena, what uh, Alexanderson did was to actually present real practical solutions for it. And you can still in South of Sweden, the west coast of Sweden in Varberg, you can see this UNESCO World Heritage Site with six different big antennas that was utilized to focus energy over the Atlantic Sea to the US so that we could communicate with each other. Uh, and that was something that we discovered after the First World War, that if there is a war, uh, so people cut the cables between continents, then how should we communicate with each other? Well, we need to have very directed transmission so we can transfer over the ocean. And uh, I'm proud to say that Alexanderson was a Swedish researcher uh, who was uh, uh, studying here at KTH, where I'm located right now. And then he moved to the US uh, and worked at uh, General Electric. And this idea, uh, of focusing energy using multiple antennas was, was known for a long time. But it was first in the late 80s and early 90s, that people started talk about that, okay, if you're focusing the energy in one direction, why not focus another piece of energy, other piece of signal in another direction at the same time? And here is a paper from a, a 1990 that is showing that there is a base station here and it's sending signal beams towards different vehicles at the same time. And this was at the time where mobile phones were actually called car phones, uh, because that was sort of the, the main use case to have a phone in your car. And uh, there were information theory about how you should design the systems that came much later, but there were patterns already in the early 90s about this idea. And sort of the, the main idea here was really focusing on this third term that I was mentioning, the spectral efficiency in bits per second per hertz in, uh, in the cell. Where the idea is that if you are increasing the number of users that you're serving, and at the same time, you increase the number of base station antennas here, so that you can focus the signals more and more, then you can make sure that the number of bits per second per hertz that you can transmit per cell is growing with number of users. So that is like having a cake, and uh, uh, if you should share it between the users, at the same time as you are, are adding users, you also grow in the cake uh, by adding more antennas. So everyone still always gets more or less the same size of their piece of cake. And in particular, it's useful to have more antennas and users if you, you scale the number of users like this and you have the same number of antennas as users to get this curve, you get a larger curve if you have twice number of antennas as users, this curve if you have four times, this curve if you have eight times. So this is demonstrating that a way of improving spectral efficiency is to add more antennas and serve more use at the same time. How do we do this? Uh, well, going back to this, example I was giving you with sending four signals from the same antennas, but with different delays. Then we can make sure that we tune the delay. So in, in one particular direction, we get signal notification. We focus the signal in that direction. If you would like to transmit two signals to users in different directions, you design it for this for one user, and then you design a similar thing with other delays for another user, and then you transmit the sum of it. So at the same time a frequency, you can send one beam in one direction, another beam in that direction. All of the antennas are transmitting both signals, but with different delays, both different between the antennas and different for the two signals, so that you are focusing them in different directions. And the size of the beams here are illustrating that, of course, you need to share the power between them. So if you have one strong beam or you have two beams that are only half of the strength. And if you cut down and like the four, so four uses at the same time, then you can do that by focusing in four different directions. All antennas transmit all four signals, but with different delays uh, so that you are, are serving them. And once again, you need to share the energy between them. Uh, so you get weaker signal per user, but all of them can be active at the same time instead of taking turns. 
So I was mentioning this was an idea that appeared already in the 90s. There were experiments being utilized for this. There were a few deployments. You can still find base stations of this kind in Tokyo, for example, uh, with 12 antennas in a circular array, but there were no really commercial success at this time. And I think that it was spurring some kind of negative experience against MIME technology. Uh, so we call this MIME or multiple input multiple output because we have multiple transmit antennas and we have multiple uses that we are serving at the same time. And in the 90s, it was still that voice calls were the main use case. So the important thing was to build a network that could uh, deal with many phone calls. It didn't matter how much data you could transmit over there because no one asked for data. There were no browsing services, just a phone call that should work. And uh, these technologies are much more useful when you like to transmit a lot of data. It would also complicate to build the hardware because for every antenna here, you had to have a cable down to a different power amplifier uh, and different radio unit and uh, a lot of different boxes. And at that time, we also wasn't sure from a theoretical side how to create the system. So people were more guessing from an engineering solution perspective rather than having a, a strong theory around how it should be done. And also the number of antennas was fairly small. So we were typically in the case where we had roughly the same number of antennas as users. And then as you saw from the curve from the previous slide, the, the gains weren't as large. The slope of the increase was much smaller. But over the last 10 years, moving now towards 5G, we have seen that MIME technology is actually appearing. So if we previously had these big antennas, one high gain antenna focusing the signal with a passive way down to where we hope the users are. Now with 5G, essentially all of the base stations that have been deployed so far are of this type, where there is 64 small antennas. Uh, and that's what I'm illustrating here. Uh, each of them have an antenna that is passively radiating and a small radio device behind it so that it can generate these different delays that I was mentioning in order to send beams in different directions. And with 64 small antennas, you can direct the signals quite narrowly towards different users. The more antennas you have, the more narrow the directivity becomes and it becomes adaptive and you can separate use in different directions. So with that, what is the massive MIMO? Uh, Massive MIME is a name that uh, was coined by Tom Marsetta at Bell Labs around 2010. He had a paper called Non-Cooperative Cellular Wireless with Unlimited Number of Base Station Antennas, uh, where he was starting to talk about this concept. The, an unlimited number of base station antennas is, of course, a crazy idea, but uh, the main idea was to have many antennas. So in my book, Massive MIME Networks, which you can download from MassiveMIMEbook.com, uh, I'm defining it as being a cellular network like this, where you have many antennas per base station. I call the number of antennas M, and I say we should have at least 64 antennas. And you should be able to multiplex eight users. So serve eight users uh, at different locations in every cell at the same time. It doesn't mean that at night there will be so many users that are awake and would like to have data, but uh, still you should support that. And an important thing is this antenna to user ratio that we typically have more antennas than users because we would like to be able to focus the energy towards this user sufficiently much so that there is little interference between them. Then all the users can work and be active at the same time. So what are then the main benefits? Uh, well, I was showing you this graph before, how the data rate might change within the cell. So we have good signals in the center, and then you have much worse at the edges here. And by being able to adapt the beams towards where the users are, we can lift it all up like this, so that you everywhere can guarantee some kind of minimum amount of service. Then we, we cannot really cheat uh, in physics. There will always be a loss of energy along the way. Uh, so there will always be variations like this, but at least we can make sure that the area where you get the maximum signal modulation that you can support is larger and at the edge of the cells you also get better performance. So this sort of means that you have a more consistent performance and hopefully this consistent performance is good enough so that you can use all of the services you want to everywhere. 
The second option or second benefit is the spatial multiplexing that as you add more users to a network, you also are able to transmit more data. So it's not like you're sharing the, uh, the uh, resources between the users. Uh, so I was mentioning earlier that as you add use to network, you would like to add more antennas. Then, of course, when you have deployed the network, you can't add more antennas. Then it's fixed. But here I show you a graph where you have 100 antennas, and then I'm increasing the number of uses. And uh, you can see that the average uh, amount, of, uh, the use of different locations, that's why it's the average. The average number of bits per second in hertz is increasing with the number of users up until a certain point where we are uh, sort of reaching the point where the number of antennas we're having cannot deal with interference anymore. And the different curves here are representing different ways of focusing the energy with our beams. Uh, the first one is just focus to where the user is and ignore that there might be other people getting interference. And if you are, are designing more complicated but smart algorithms that are trying to find ways of directing signals so that you are balancing between forcing interference to other people and focus on where it should be, then you can increase the rate, uh, spectral efficiency by a lot. And uh, some people <laughs> that are starting to look about on 5G, there's, for example, a guy, William Webb, who I've been talking about the 5G myth. Oh, 5G will never provide us with the gains that um, uh, was promised. Uh, and, and in a way, uh, some people have been overstating what 5G is going to do, uh, but uh, it's also unfair to say that 5G will not deliver the tra data traffic that people were asking for, because uh, the main point of the entire 5G technology here is that as more people use the technology, we can increase the spectral efficiency and therefore we can deliver that capacity. But it's not like we're going to create needs for data faster than those 25 to 30 percent increase per year than I was mentioning earlier. So this is sort of a very scalable technology. Over a long time, the number of users will grow and then the capacity will automatically grow with the number of users. One of the key issues with having many antennas and forming these beams is that we need to know where to form the beams. And the traditional way of doing that, that was designed for having small number of antennas, is based on code books or grid of beams. You let the base station try out a number of predefined beams, yellow, green, red, and so on. And then the user here is listening to different beams, and it feeds back a signal saying, I prefer the green beam or the red beam. Uh, and the problem is that if you have 64 antennas, in order to uh, sweep around all directions, you will need to have 64 of these beams. Uh, because the more antennas you have, the more narrow each one is. So you need to have more to cover all the directions. This becomes rather impractical when you have many antennas. The other option, uh, which is what is mainly used now in, uh, for Massive MIME, at least in research, is to instead let the user transmit the signal to the base station. And when the user is transmitting, the signal goes over the air and all the antennas can listen to it and see how strong was the signal and what delay did it come in with. And then it knows how to form a beam back by uh, inverting those delays. So if it was a long delay to one antenna, we transmit earlier from that one and the other way around. And this is, I think, the ideal way of creating the adaptive beam forming. It only works in what is known as TDD or time division duplex system, where you are uh, it, uh, having one band for both transmitting from the base station to the users and from the user to the base stations. Many of the 2D, 3D, 4D systems were based on having one frequency band for the uplink and one for the downlink. But now in 5G, essentially all the bands that are being used are of this kind where you're switching between uplink and downlink in time. So you can do this. So the word massive, how massive are massive MIMA systems? Uh, here is a recent Ericsson Live broadcast about their new product. Here is how large it is compared to the people here. It, it, it's maybe large as a, as a person, but uh, this equipment here contains 64 antennas, each of them connected with three smaller elements. It's, it's 20 kilo large. It contains antennas and radius inside the box. It could cover 200 megahertz of bandwidth. It consumes 320 watts at maximum power, and it has 
integrate the circuit and everything. So 20 kilos is certainly something that anyone uh, could, could lift up. So it's not massive in weight. It's not even massive in size. It's just massive in the number of antenna elements. So that is sort of what that name really means. So it might be a misleading name actually. But now when massive MIMI start to be deployed in 5G systems, uh, I think that essentially all of the deployments so far is in the 3.5 gigahertz band using this kind of 64 antenna arrays. Maybe not this particular one, which is a new one weighing 20 kilo, maybe an older one that weighs 40 kilo. Uh, but anyway, when we are putting the map, will the space station provide us with the performance that people like me who has writing books on the topic uh, have predicted that it will be? Well. This is something that I studied the other year together with some colleagues at a company called Cyradel in France who are making ray tracing software for figuring out how does the waves propagate in real cities. So they took out the part here of, I think, New York City, put up a base station at 64 different locations, put up users randomly in different buildings, and then they computed the propagation environment, how the waves are propagating in an advanced way. And there is something called spatial correlation that's important here. It's not just one signal that reaches the user, they will bounce on different objects. And the ray geometry that you have here will determine uh, how the signal can look like, and the angles and shapes of the object here will also determine these type of things. So how the network looks like in space becomes very important. We had some assumptions, we had 16 cells, maybe I said it wrong before, uh, had nine users per cell around that. 3.5 gigahertz band, so typical 5G band, 20 megahertz of bandwidth, uh, typical base station power, and a good pre-coding algorithm and good power allocation algorithm, so the state of the art. And here I will show you a result for this. So what I am showing you are three different setups. One is to take the simplest formulas that Marcetta, uh, Tom Marcetta was proposing to utilize in his first papers on this topic of massive MIMO. So that's sort of a baseline, what you, we hope to achieve. Then we're considering two different deployments. One is a planar array uh, that is one meter times uh, 34 uh, centimeters. So it contains 24 antennas in one direction and eight in that direction. So there's 192 elements in total. Or we make a long array, uh, 192 horizontally, only one antenna on each column. And here I'm showing uh, the downlink throughput per user in megabits per second that users are getting when they are at different random locations. So what the horizontal axis here is showing is that uh, users are distributed randomly and here are the variations that you are achieving. Sometimes you get a large number, then you are a lucky user, and sometimes you have a small number and then you are an unlucky user getting much smaller throughputs. So if you're up here, then these three different cases, the curves are rather similar. So it seems like massive MIMO in Marchetta theory and practical setups. I think this plane array here is what is closest to the products that I use today. Uh, and those two curves, which are the red and the uh, black one, are quite close together. So massive MIMO gives us the performance that we are expecting. But if you are down here for the unlucky users, we can see that the red curve, which is this plane array, the one we are using now, and the black curve, which is the ideal case, there is a big gap. And what is, uh, while if we have a very long uniform linear array, uh, so it's uh, eight meters long, then we have a much smaller difference. And that is really the thing that to really make use of the, the good gains from massive MIMO, we need to have large arrays. The, uh, it's not the number of elements that really matters, uh, that's important too, but it's how they are uh, put out in the geometry. We would like them to be long. And this is not how we are building base stations up today. So with that, I will come into the last part about the MIME evolution beyond 5G. And I think this quote is very important when it comes to talking about future developments. Uh, Roy Amara, who was a futurist uh, working, for example, at Stanford, he said that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. And let me give an example of that. Uh, so if you try to build a new technology now beyond 5G, 
people start to think about, oh, what will be the 60 application? What will be the cool things that we could do in the future that we can't do today? The problem is that we don't even know what 5G is going to be utilized for uh, yet. I don't have a 5G phone. I have a 4G phone still. Uh, and to give you an example of how difficult it is to predict the future, I was digging out a report from 2004 from OECD, uh, which is a sort of an economical uh, discussion agency among um, countries. And they were talking about what 3D was going to be utilized for. 3D was first introduced in 1998. But five years later, they wrote this report where they talked about the 3D applications. Here is a list of them. And one of the main applications was video calling. And I remember what the first time I went to uh, and heard about uh, 3G, I, I talked with some people in the industry and they said, uh, 3G uh, will mainly be used for video calls. That is our main service. It turns out that there were no one using video calls in 2004. Very few, at least. I mean, FaceTime was used in 2010. That was when it was started. And now, during the pandemic, we are using video call all the time. So, uh, which is sort of an example that in the short term, people thought video calling will be the big 3D thing. And now, 15 years later, it has become a big thing that is dominating our daily way of working now. But it took much longer time than people were believing. And in the same way, Broadband internet access was supposed to be the big thing in 3D, but the first iPhone was first released in 2008. That, that was when people started to use the internet. And it was first when the internet was adapted to small sizes uh, that people really started to use the internet in the phone. So that also took a much longer time. So if you read papers about 60 applications, all of them is just speculations. I, I think from a engineering perspective, what we should focus on is instead to try to develop new technologies that could improve things that matters and not try to think too much about the application because someone will figure out what they can be used for later on. So focusing then on evolving technology and not on applications, I have been thinking a lot about how we can evolve the MIMO communication beyond 5G. And I'm trying to think about what are the research directions that might give us a 10 times improvement in terms of something. Because if something only gives a 10 or 20 percent improvement, probably when you implement it and you need to take care of that things doesn't really work as was planned from the beginning, you will lose all these benefits. But if you aim for 10 times improvements, then you can hopefully be able to get at least five times improvements. Uh, and I think that was why massive MIMO is now the main uh, new thing in 5G, because it is increasing spectral efficiency by many, in a factor maybe 10. If you, at least over uh, time, it will be like that when more users have been in the network. And I will briefly mention three ways that we can uh, evolve the uh, technology. One is called self-free networks, one is called reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, and one is called physically large arrays. So I will provide you with like two slides on each of these topics. So self-free networks is something that becomes useful when we have densified networks a lot. So I was showing you earlier that if you have a lot of base stations, the, the data rate is going up and down very quickly depending on where you are, because it's dominated by interference. So cellular networks have for decades been built on this principle. You put up a base station, each user is connecting to the closest base station, you create these cell areas, but you have the issue that some users are close to multiple base stations, and then there will be a lot of intercell interference. So it's simple to operate like this. The base station don't need to talk to each other, they just uh, are interfering with each other without talking. But when you have a dense network, it becomes the main bottleneck. The other option is to let the same uh, antennas here be uh, deployed, but you would like them to coordinate what they're doing. So you connect them with cables to each other. You connect them to a central processing unit here or edge cloud or whatever we would like to call it. There's a lot of talk about um, cloud computing these days. And you let all the access point cooperate now in order to serve all the users. So a user here will be served by all of the base stations or access point APs that can reach them and would otherwise cause interference to them. And this way we are alleviating all of the intercell interference because there is only one big area where every user is served by all of the surrounding access points. 
So to show you what this could lead to, I have this simulation where I'm comparing an area where I put up either four base stations with a uh, big arrays, 110 on each one. So that's like cellular massive magnet. Or I take 400 access point, each with one antenna, and I'm spreading it out over the area like this. And I either let each antenna create its own small cell around it, or I connect all of them to this kind of edge cloud that is operating them as one joint system. And here I'm showing the spectral efficiency that each user that I drop randomly in this area is getting in bits per second per hertz of bandwidth. And th this is a cumulative distribution function. So for random locations, we see this variation. So some people get low values, some people get large values. And the curve to the right here is with this cell-free approach where all the access points are cooperating. The two other curves that are very similar is for conventional massive MIMO and for having 400 small cells. So you can see that those are performing equally well, essentially. Uh, the curves are almost the same. So it's more a question about can we afford putting up 400 small base stations or is it cheaper to keep a few number of base stations and put more advanced hardware there? The performance becomes roughly the same. The big uh, thing here is that if we have all of these users cooperating, we can deal with interference. And then the users that would otherwise have poor performance can get a much larger improvement. Particularly when you have a low rate, you will get a much better improvement. So here is like a four to five times improvement. So this is all of one of the potential ways of moving. We put up more access point antennas per square kilometer. There are a few antennas for each access point and you let them cooperate and you connect them to the same edge computers that are computing how to operate. And this is what my new book on foundation of user-centric self-free massive MIMO is about. And uh, if you're interested in this topic, you can drop me an email. And I will send you the PDF of the book. And uh, we had this implementation concept together with Ericsson as well of how you can deploy this. They were particularly interested in putting up equipment like this on cultural places where there's a lot of people but you're not allowed to put up a big base station because they look ugly. So this is the Fontana di Trevi in Rome. Uh, and I'm standing here with uh, the concept uh, of having a cable with antennas built in that you can put up on the walls. Uh, and this way, you get many antennas that are distributed between each other and have power supply, frontal and everything within one cable. The second future direction for MIMO technology is something called reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. Uh, here, the idea is that instead of having many antennas at the transmitter or at the receiver, we put up a surface, like a mirror on the wall, but the, it's not a fixed mirror. It's still adaptive, just as we are considering adaptive beam forming in massive MIMO. So the idea is that the transmitter is sending out the signal, reaches a surface, which is scattering or reflecting the signal, as a beam focused towards the receiver. And if you zoom in on this uh, surface here, what it's containing is many small elements. Each element is uh, like a small mirror. The signal is reaching it, and then it uh, is being scattered. And it's a passive way, the element in the way that it scatters them in a predetermined way, but we have one special thing we can control the impedance in each element separately. And the impedance is determining something called the reflection coefficient, namely uh, the delay uh, that, or, or phase shift that the signal will get before it gets reflected, and what fraction of the signal that is reflected and what's absorbed. And you can also change things like polarization. So by uh, doing this, uh, using materials called metas materials, you have a so-called software control meta surface or configurable intelligent surface or intelligent reflecting surface, the many names for this concept, where you are controlling the surface. It's like electronically bending the shape of it so that the signal is reflected towards where you would like it to be. And this could be a new way of building relays in order to improve the signal uh, coverage of an area, uh, improve channel conditions. And it, it might be simpler in some cases to deploy this than to deploy extra base station and connect them together so you can deal with interference. And here's an experiment uh, with some colleague in China that was showing this. 
They have put up a transmitter over here, 50 meters away. Here is a copper plate uh, that uh, the signal is reaching, and then it's supposed to be reflected towards this receiver here. And we have, on purpose, rather directive antennas. And if it's a copper plate, uh, then the signal gets uh, reflected according to Stell's law, which in this case means that it's just reflected back. Not much is being received here. So if you look at in our frequency spectrum here, here is the received signal power. We see that in our band, there is some things larger than the noise, but it's not much. And if we're replacing this copper plate with this intelligent uh, surface that we can configure, then we can configure it such that the, the waves that are reaching it is reflected towards this receiver. And then we see something much different. We can increase the, uh, here was the received power minus 66 uh, decibel a milliwatt. And here is minus 39 decibels a milliwatt. So there's a really an, a, what is it? 25 dB uh, improvement, which is uh, more than hundred times. So this is a way of using the MIMO idea to design uh, sort of new ways of reflecting signals and improve signals. This could be used to reflect things around the corner or sort of even out the performance in a cell. The final thing is what I call physically large arrays. So we, we call things massive MIMO. And in 5G, massive MIMO is something designed so far for the 3.5 gigahertz band. It's a box that you put on the rooftop, which may be 20 kilo. It might be one meter times half a meter large. Uh, contains 64 antenna integrated radios. Uh, so it, it's large and, and somewhat heavy if you stand next to it. Uh, and we can use it for all these cool things like directing signals to different users and uh, both have strong signal towards users and so many users. But when you as a user is observing the signal, it's not a large antenna. There are many antennas in the box, but from your viewpoint, it is rather small. What if we would build a really physically large array, something that fills up your field of view? You, you spread out antennas, for example, over the facade of a building like this. What can happen then when you have a so-called electrically large area? Well, you can focus things in a much different way in space. So here is a way of showing that. So, so you, you might have, <laughs> you, you definitely have noticed thing that if you only have one eye open, you, you have a difficulty of seeing the depth of things. Well, with two eyes, you have a stereo vision, so you could uh, see the depth of things, how far away objects are. And there is a similar kind of thing that happens when you have large arrays compared to distances. So here, just to illustrate it, I have a, an array which with antennas that is five wavelengths long, and I would like to focus the signals towards a location which is five wavelengths away. And then I'm showing you how focused energy is, how much stronger is the signal at this point compared to if I only were transmitting from one of them. And in this case, we can see that we get a, a 10 times stronger signal in a small region around the user because it's only large numbers here and everywhere else it's small. So you really are focusing the energy at a small region, like a quarter of wavelengths, like a small sphere around your mobile phone. And this happens when the width of the array is similar as a distance to the user. So here's what's five uh, wavelength, but if you have a 10 meter long array, if you're 10 meters from it, this will happen. And if you have something that is 50 meters, then if you are at 50 meters, you can focus energy like this. And this doesn't happen when you are further away. So even if you're just like twice the distance, 10 wavelengths away, you focus signals at the point here, and then behind the point, the signal is continuing to be strong. And that is what it means to create a beam, that you focus towards the point where the user is, but the signal becomes strong in all directions that are uh, in front of it and behind it. What can we utilize something like this for? Well, there is a concept uh, that uh, one can define called the spatial degrees of freedom. And this is the number of data signals or the number of users that we can multiplex from one array like this that we can send different signals to and still be able to separate them so we can get good signal there. Uh, one can define this mathematically, I don't want to do that, but it sort of means that we can control the interference between them. 
And this concept of spatial degrees of freedom is somewhat similar to the sampling theorem in, in signal processing, uh, which is saying that if you have a band limited signal, you should sample it twice per period in order to be able to reconstruct it. And here it's like if you have a world, you should uh, you can sample it by putting up users at uh, twice something in order to be able to separate users. And if you have an array like this, which has a length uh, that is L and a height which is H, then what can show that the number of signals that you can serve is L times uh, H, and then you take pi divided by lambda squared. Uh, so, for example, if you have a 10 meters times 30 meters array at the 3 gigahertz band, where the lambda is 0 0.1 meter, then this becomes 100,000. So if you put this on the facade of a skyscraper, you can serve 100,000 people around there. Uh, so if you have a, uh, I had an example once, you put it up in New York City on one of the buildings there, then you have 100,000 people in Central Park, and you can serve all of them using one array like this. So I would say that with the MIME technology, we are very far from the limits. The, the problem is to have enough users so you can regularly use it. This. Right now, each base station might only have two users, so you're very far from 100,000 users at the time. And you also need the propagation channels to provide us with the richness. It must be bouncing sufficiently many objects for this to happen. So, in summary, uh, I would say that the evolution of wireless technologies is happening in two dimensions right now. One is uh, that conventional networks have been built in frequency spectrum below 6 gigahertz, like 3, you know, 3 gigahertz band or 1 gigahertz band or 2 gigahertz band, and we are using passive antennas. In 5G, what we are doing is that we are moving up to using adaptive beamforming in the form of massive MIMO. And there's also talk about using millimeter wave spectrum, which is spectrum in larger uh, bands, 30 gigahertz band. And the reason for that is just to get more bandwidth. And we talked about it earlier, more bandwidth increases the data rate, but it doesn't change the shape of the, uh, the performance over the area. And for that reason, so far, it has been dominant. Most of the deployments have been over here, uh, but there are hope that in the second phase of 5G, we will use millimeter wave technology as well. And because of this movement from uh, low frequencies to higher frequencies, when people talk about 6G uh, and beyond 5G, there's also talk, oh, we need to continue up in the frequency domain to get more spectrum. Uh, th the problem is that uh, th the problem of the networks of the day is not that you have too low data rates when you're standing close to your base station. The problem is that it doesn't work when you are far away. So you have too large variations. So that's why I think that the important thing is to move in this direction. Uh, stay on the lower frequencies. Propagation conditions are typically better. Signal goes through walls better. And instead, evolve massive MIMO into something that is even more capable of serving many users and evening out the performance differences. So we have the physically large arrays that can be used to serve many, many users in the small area. And we have the cell-free network approach where we're spreading out antennas and let them cooperate in order to even out the variations. So with that, I'm reaching the end of my presentation. If you would like to know more of my, my view and uh, listen to me talking much more, you can find on my YouTube channel, which is called Wireless Future, uh, a lot of videos on these topics. And I also have a podcast called Wireless Future as well. So with that, I've seen that there are many questions being posted, so I will be happy to try to answer some of them. Okay, thank you, sir, for this very informative session. Um, all the illustrations and examples that you use really simplify the concepts and help us understand better. Um, I am going to read out the questions that typed in the chat box by the participants. So um, you can read or you can answer. Um, mm -hmm. The first question is, is there any relation between channel capacity loss and... Uh, Rubi, you can read out the questions to sir. Yes, sir, I'm reading. Should I... Uh, am I audible? Hello, yeah, am I I'm audible? here. You, you can hear me? Yes, yes, sir. I can hear yes, you. Yes, good. Um, so yes. I read the question. Uh, is, is there any relation between channel capacity loss and spectral efficiency in MIMO? 
Um, so I'm not sure I, I fully understand the, the, the question here. So, so one thing is measured in Purcell and one uh, without Purcell. So you sort of, you, uh, you take the spectral efficiency that you have for cell and multiply with number of base station to get the, uh, the total number of uh, um, of data that you can transmit. Uh, uh, but I think in my view, you sort of have these two different things. You could, uh, it's not really a technology about increasing the spectral efficiency per user. You can do some improvement uh, with adaptive beamforming, but I think the main improvement is coming from that you can serve many more users at the same time. Okay. So the another question is as we move from MIMO to massive MIMO, complexity at hardware level and computations increase a lot. How coordination among massive number antennas is obtained? How could we realize it at the physical layer? Yeah, so this is a, it's a good question. And this is what we were asked all the time 10 years ago. People were extremely skeptical against this idea. And that was particularly for this uh, idea that the way that we have built base station in the past is that you have an antenna at one location, then you have a cable to radio unit that is generating the analog signal, then you have a cable to a computer who's computing the digital signal, and if you should have 64 antennas, you will have to have a lot of cables, a lot of boxes, and it uh, just becomes complicated. But, I mean, uh, there is no reason why you have to build it like that, and that is why also why these new base stations are working uh, very well. So in this box here, there are 64 antennas uh, or 64 radio units connected to 192 antenna elements. There is all the, the, the circuitry and everything. I think what you should think about, it, like take your mobile phone, take out the small piece of the phone that is uh, antenna radio unit. And then you take 64 of them, put them next to each other. It won't be too big. It won't be expensive. Uh, it's just an engineering effort of putting this together. Okay, sir. Um, which frequency band is preferred for best performance of massive MIMO antenna? Um, yes. So uh, I, I was mentioning these two, two different uh, benefits um, uh, of MIMO. Like, like these ones, and uh, massive MIMO is something that is useful uh, in in many all kinds of frequency bands. But I would say that uh, the I think the main op uh, benefit is uh, in lower bands because then you can get both of these gains, both stronger signal, and you can serve many users. When you go up in frequency, you have very short range, uh, so it is. Um, harder to have many users because the area is smaller, there will be fewer people packed into there. Uh, so it would take much longer time before we will need to serve many users and utilize the spatial multiplexing gain uh, in those cases. And um, uh, so, so in the higher bands, it's mainly about the beam forming improvements, but it's being used in all these bands now. Uh, what is reflecting or RZF? Um... Yeah, on this one here, I, I didn't explain the abbreviations. Uh, so MR stands for maximum ratio transmission. That means that we are focusing the signal to, to maximize the signal to noise ratio. And RZS stands for regularized zero forcing. Uh, that is the way of zero forcing means you try to direct the beams so that you cause zero interference. And regularized zero forcing means that we, we are balancing between uh, Cancelling all interference and um, uh, only trying to keep the interference below the noise. And the, the, the final one here is called multi cell minimum mean squared error, uh, is the met, uh, minimum mean squared error uh, being for me. Uh, one, one can read more about these things in, in my book, Massive Bible Networks. Okay. Is there a considerable surface? It's similar like conventional reflectors. Yes, so I would say it, it, it is sort of an evolution of reflector rays. So uh, I think traditional reflector rays were just fixed things. You, uh, they were designed to reflect in one fixed direction. You put it up and that's it. Uh, then there are adaptive reflector rays. And, uh, and uh, then I, I think the main difference between what is uh, uh, viewed uh, here 
as in the reconfigurable intelligent surface is that uh, reflect arrays are typically uh, next to the transmitter or next to the receiver. So it's sort of viewed as part of one of them, while this one is supposed to be on purpose placed somewhere else in between. Uh, so, uh, I mean, what one could view it as, um, if I go back to one of my first figures. No, um, this one. Uh, one could potentially put up a surface on the wall here to reflect the signal around here. So it's not neither close to the transmitter nor to the receiver, but somewhere else. Um, moving towards 5G MM waves, which refers to higher uh, gigahertz frequency, is it harmful for health? Dr. Theodore Rapp Rappaport talks about SCI surface absorption rate in its association. What is the exact scenario about it? Uh, I'm not an expert on uh, when it comes to uh, potential health issues with radiation. Uh, I think this is a well studied topic. Uh, I think one could look at the International Telecommunications Union's work group around this type of things. Uh, I, I think what I usually answer around these things is that most things in life are dangerous in two large doses. Rice is dangerous because it, it contains arsenic, which is a poison. Still, we can eat rice and we don't die because of arsenic poisoning, because the doses are sufficiently small. And it's the same kind of thing here. It, you can probably, uh, by having too much energy in, in radio waves, heat up your skin so much that you get damaged by it. But it's not something that happens in real uh, reality because we have limitations on the uh, the energy levels that we are allowed to be utilized in for wireless communication. Please comment on DCI's W band technological impact on 5G and beyond. Uh, v, -band, v band or W band? Yeah, I, I, I'm not uh, so familiar with, with, with what, what frequency range uh, that band is. So if the person who asked the, the question could, <laughs> could remind me about that, I, I can answer it. Um, can VLC be proved to be a game changer in 5G? Yeah, so, so VLC is, is uh, visible light communications. I I personally don't think so. And, and that is uh, going, uh, I'm sure there are other people who are dedicated to that topic and would strongly disagree, but uh, I, I think that the, the general uh, uh, belief that wireless uh, technologies are moving to the right here from uh, uh, lower bands, 5G is millimeter wave, 6G will be sub terahertz or visible light communications. I don't see that happening. 5G was supposed to be all about millimeter wave and now we have, it's all deployed in uh, uh, the 3.5 gigahertz band. There was a few 5G uh, deployments in millimeter wave in, in the US and the, in Korea, for example, but uh, that's it. I, I, I think it, it will be small use cases where this will happen and that we don't seldom need those very high peak rates. Uh, so I think visible light communication will continue to be a, a good technology for niche applications where we have line of sight scenarios and fixed locations, things like that. But I don't view it as a, a game changer and it's definitely not a part of 5G either because it, so far 5G is only up to like 70 gigahertz. What are the challenges of tariffree massive MIMO adoption and what are the open research challenges? Can DSP happen in an edge cloud for all DSPs, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I had a, a slide here uh, that I didn't show. Uh, I think that when it comes to cell-free massive MIMO, that the physical layer transmissions, how you should send out signals, that, that is well known. That is what my, my book on the topic is about. I think the, the real challenges is particularly related to this edge cloud that was mentioned that we should um, uh, uh, we, we need to, uh, if we have infinite capacity on the, the cabling between the 
different antennas, we could operate things ideally, but uh, the problem would be to to operate a system with limited information, limited delays between things. And then I think that if you are used to building cellular networks, you break down the coverage area into small regions and we are letting each region do scheduling, resource allocation, broadcasting of signals in, in a per cell uh, way. I think that um, um, it's those kind of things um, uh, that we now need to do over the entire network in a scalable manner. Um, so, so I think it's a higher layer things, back layer, network layer uh, aspects, and also going down and build something like this and figure out how to synchronize things properly. That is the big challenges. Here is a lot of research in MM rails and terahertz communication. Do you see in the future the adoption of these in combination with massive MIMO or cell-free massive MIMO in the coverage tires, not in small cells, etc.? I think that uh, these uh, technologies will be used. I I think uh, that. I view it more as a small cell tier, as uh, was implied here. Uh, the coverage tier will be sort of continue having a uh, big base station or uh, maybe some cell free massive MIMO network that could uh, operate at lower frequency and provide us with the baseline coverage everywhere. And then at selected locations where there's a lot of users, you put up small cells using higher frequencies to sort of take away. A lot of the traffic in those areas, but not to uh, do much more than that. So uh, I think it's sort of really the division uh, between uh, things here. Uh, we're going to the top here uh, to provide good coverage everywhere and guarantee a good service quality everywhere. And then for extremely high data rates, we go to the right here at selected locations. Can you comment on massive MIMO and NOMAD integration? I know I know. Yeah, so uh, I actually wrote a blog post about this uh, that I submitted yesterday. Uh, so uh, no mice is non orthogonal multiple access, which is based on the idea that uh, traditionally in like 3D or 4D networks, we are uh, serving one user at a time at every frequency. And then there were the idea that in in information theory, it's better to let multiple users transmit at the same time, and then we deal with interference using processing. Uh, and uh, then the next step was to sort of on top of that, but it, 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 we could add antennas uh, to do to MIMO. And uh, then we discover, what, but if we have many antennas, we, we are focusing the signals very narrowly to different users. And this can, then there is very seldom two users that are interfering a lot with each other. There might be many users that cause little interference to each other so that the interference builds up and becomes large. But there is seldom two users that cause a lot of interference. And NOMA is a method to deal with situations when you have two users that cause a lot of interference to each other. So I think there is a reason why there were a lot of fuss about NOMA. Uh, if 10 years ago or five years ago, uh, this is going to be the new 5G thing. And then 5G is here, Massive MIMO is there, but not NOMA, because the added benefit of NOMA on top of Massive MIMO is very small. Uh, so uh, in terms of increasing data rates, no, I, I, I think NOMA is a dead technology, but, but some aspect of it might still be utilized in cases where you don't care much about efficiency, but rather that you can have many users, they want to send small pieces of data, you give them some non orthogonal spreading sequences in a uh, coding domain approach, and you let them transmit whenever they like. They don't need to ask for permission to transmit, and then you deal with interference by processing. Uh, those type of methods of NOMA could be utilized, but uh, I think it's a, it is an outdated technology in general. Will there be any difference in the network performance if we interchange the number of antennas in rows and columns of MIMO BS array? For example, if there are eight rows and two columns for one, and for mm -hmm. the other, there are two rows and eight columns, which array will perform better? Yeah, th this is a, a good uh, question. Uh, and uh, I, I think I, uh, in the interest of time, removed the slide that uh, was sort of. Um, Focus on this, but 
if you look at uh, at the scenario that I was simulating here, uh, I cannot see why I cannot move my screen. Yeah. So what I concluded from this example was that you want the array to be long in the horizontal dimension and not be a compact array. And the reason is that users in the real world are usually distributed in different angles horizontally. So you want to have many antennas there to be able to steer the directions, the signals very narrowly towards those locations. While most people are not distributed vertically. In the city with high raised building, you can have some benefits from being able to direct beams up and down. But in general, it is better to have many antennas horizontally uh, than vertically. Does RIS also do beam uh, forming? Rutvi, Rutvi, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, yes, I, think, I think we are having a lot of queries. Um, so I would suggest that uh, those who are in queries can send the email uh, now to Dr. Ahmed. Uh, is, is that okay, sir? Yeah, yeah, sure. Because like this, I think uh, people would like to interact with you, um, and I can see the amount of questions um, people are having like this. Uh, it will keep on going. Then I don't want you yeah. um, to hold on for too long. Uh, yeah, so it, I would it, suggest uh, that those who are having any of the doubts can can just email to you, right? Yes, definitely. So uh, I can just answer that last question about the RS. That yes, one can view it as a, a kind of beam forming uh, that the surface is receiving a signal and then it's delaying the signals in different ways so that when it sends out it again, you are delaying it uh, uh, as in a beam forming way so that it gets strong in one direction and not in other directions. So thank you for all of the questions. And as was said, uh, please feel free to send me a question by email or commenting on my YouTube videos or something like that, and I will try to uh, to answer. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll invite um, Mayure sir for the final word of thanks and uh, to deliver the nomination to you, sir. Uh, Mayure sir. Thank you, Arpan sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for sharing your valuable knowledge and time with us. It was a privilege to have with you with us today. We would like to express our gratitude for such an enlightening talk on MIMO technology, 5G, and beyond. And we are definite that it will help our students evident. Also, we would like to thank IEEE Gujarat section for this golden opportunity for a collaborative event, especially Professor Chilak Pawala, sir, chairperson. IEEE SPS the chapter and Dr. Arpan Desai, technical activity chair IEEE SPS the chapter for the continuous support guidance. Along with this, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Satvik Khara, vice chair, food and activity Gujarat section and chapter advisor IEEE SOU SPS SB and Dr. Saroj Dastur, Chapter Advisor IEEE SCAD SPSSP and all the volunteers of both the IEEE, both IEEE Silver Oak University SB and IEEE Sarvajanik College of Engineering and Technology SB for their valuable contribution in making this event possible and successful. Last but not the least, I would also like to thank all the enthusiastic participa participants for joining. We are looking forward for such knowledgeable events in the future and are expecting the same enthusiasm from all of you. Once again, thank you everyone. Now, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, sir. Um, now, on behalf of IEEE SPS Gujarat chapter, IEEE SOU SPS SB chapter and IEEE SCAD SPS chapter, we would like to felicitate our eminent speaker, Emil Johnson, sir, the token of gratitude and appreciation. Thank you very much for attending and for inviting me and for asking a lot of nice questions. So I hope to, to meet you at some physical event in the future. Bye bye. So can I just request all of you to turn on the cameras for our, for our group picture? Sir, feedback link is also required. Yeah, yes. I'll do that. Um,
Everyone, please turn on your cameras. Uh, Ruchi, I think they won't be able to do it uh, because they are not allowed to do it. Okay, sir. I've taken the screenshot. Yeah, sure. That's fine. Um, and uh, I'm sharing the feedback link in the chat box. All the okay. participants are requested to finish without fail to receive the certificate. You will be made the certificate by the end of this week. Please take the feedback link. Okay. 